Hey folks, this is Matt once again, and finally getting around to reviewing. I want to give a thanks once again to Wilkes363 who sent me this. Galaxy of Terror. I've reviewed Forbidden World, so why not Galaxy of Terror? Now, Galaxy of Terror was a Roger Corman production, directed by a guy named Bruce Clark. And I know my friend Michael Keen had reviewed this. I don't know if it's still on YouTube or if it's on another channel like Daily Motion or VO or something. I'm not 100% sure. And uh, first off, this DVD is really good. It has a booklet, it has a lot of info on the making of the film. It has another sleeve that you turn around, even though it's a shitty title Mind Warp and Infinity of Terror. Even though this cover has nothing to do with the movie, it's still a good looking cover. And this is pretty much around when Alien had come out among other films. This was a 1981 film and after Battle Beyond the Stars, which I know is still a film I don't have, I haven't seen yet, but one day I will. The Roger Corman said, okay, let's do something a little bit more, give it a little bit bigger of a budget. Although still very small compared to a lot of stuff. And watching this film again, I gotta say, there was some video, not a video, but like a, a DVD or something that was made that was talking about like the 50 worst films of all time. It was like an official DVD release for people to buy. This was one of them. I'm sorry, this is not one of the 50 worst films of all time. I can name tons more. Feeders, Feeders 2, fucking Star Crystal, shitloads more. Watchers Reborn, which really enough is a corner production, I think. Anything that's on Sci-Fi Channel nowadays. I mean, this film has a lot of stuff going to it and going for it. But... And this film, you know, is considered an alien ripoff. It's not really an alien ripoff at all. I don't get the alien ripoff reference in this movie. Because what it is... By the way, a few people let me know that this cover, I guess, kind of was used for another film called The Brain Machine or something. Although they said it was pretty shitty. I've never seen it. Uh, pretty much you have this mystical fi I guess mystical figure called the the master or planet master which kind of leads to my main problem with the film which is the ending because you don't know much about this planet master you don't really know much about this figure but apparently there was this planet called uh, Morgonthus somewhere around there and at the beginning of the film there's a person there and he gets killed and so there's going to be a rescue team that's sent over there. And this master, Planet Master, has this like red glow on his face. Orders a rescue team to go over there. And this rescue team, you have the lead guy, who I thought the lead guy was really good. Edward Albert, who's no longer with us. But Edward, Edward Albert I really liked as the lead guy. You have Aaron Moran who was Joni on Happy Days, and of course Joni loves Chachi. You have Ray Walston from My Favorite Martian, he's the cook. You have Robert England, of course Freddy Krueger himself, Nightmare on Elm Street. You have Zalman Keen, yes the same guy who Red Shoe Diaries and all that stuff, he was an actor and he was in this film. And also Sid Haig from House of the Thos Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects. And you have a few more others, but hell of a cast when you think about it. And they're on this crew, and they go to this planet, and something pulls them down onto the planet, and they search a ship, and they later on find a pyramid, and they search that, looking for survivors, then ultimately trying to find something so that their ship can leave. And really what you find out is that it's not an alien ripoff, it's they it plays on people's fears, meaning that it kind of takes stuff you're afraid of and turns it around on you. Uh, for instance, there's an actress, was it Taffy O'Connell, 
who she gives like a throwaway line about worms, not liking worms. And so, of course, you have a worm that grows to humongous size, rapes her, and kills her. Now, weirdly enough, that was a scene that was added later on by Corman, because the director and writer didn't want that. They didn't write a rape scene, so they're, they're not a fan of it, that kind of subject matter. So they decided to do it so over the top that it kind of lessens the impact. And I, they, It kind of worked, because I'm not a fan. Even though I know it's a movie, I'm not a fan of even the rape sequences. Uh, but because it was so over the top... Uh, the actress herself, she said that while doing it, she was laughing because she kept reminding her of Ed Wood with the octopus and Bill Lugosi and stuff. Um, so, which I think made me be able to watch it and such. And it's probably one of the most famous scenes from the movie. And also, you have Sid Haig's character. He's a guy who has these crystals, and he's a mute. And in fact, in the script, he wasn't meant to be a mute. But he's like, I have one condition if I play this role. I just don't want any dialogue. I don't know if that was just him saying that he thought his dialogue fucking sucked ass or what. But he was pretty much mute. Except he has one line which even, which he said was such a bad line. I live and die by the crystals. <laughs> and lo and behold, that's what happens. Because he has these sort of crystals that are like big fucking ninja stars. At one point, they break, and he's very upset about it. But later on, he finds that these crystals brought back together by it, itself. And, like I said, this thing plays with your fears, and every single death scene is very interesting. Like, before I get to that, for instance, yeah, this guy was very steered, and this thing comes, wraps around him, and gets on his head and does this and you have blood leaking down so I guess in a way the thing kind of scalped him or something uh, you have one who's the commander of the team she had this disaster that happened long ago and she thinks it's still out there and ultimately one release another and she just completely burned up you have another character like I said she gets raped and killed by this big ass worm Sid hates character. He has the crystals, and the crystals digs into his arm. A piece breaks off, and you see the piece go under his arm. You know, it's under the skin and bulging from the skin and going up, and he has to cut his own arm off. Then the arm goes by itself, grabs the, the crystal, and throws it right into Sid hates chest. Um, you have Aaron Moran. I think that's her name. Uh, you get the idea that she's claustrophobic, so that leads to a scene where she has to go through a narrow tunnel. She gets wrapped around and constricted, and ultimately something goes around her face to the point it goes and her face pretty much blows up, like caves in. <laughs> like the pressure just like face blows up. <laughs> um, Zalman Keen, he's like a asshole, hot shit, thinks he's hot shit. Some monster gets his ass, fucking rips his fucking guts and stuff. So that's what I mean. Every death scene is like, it's interesting. It's not an alien ripoff because each one is like so many different things that could kill you, which I made it interesting. And also the low budget that they had, they really used it well. I don't understand why low budget films of today, whether it be Sci-Fi Channel or stuff that goes direct to DVD, Blu-ray, whatever you want to call it. Why they can't learn from this? Like, they should learn lessons from Roger Corman. Roger Corman himself should learn from his old self. Because I don't understand why films of today, they had a low budget and it looks great. I mean, I don't think this is a bad looking film at all. I mean, yeah, they were the landscape is inspired by H.R. Dieter type. I think the original idea for Alien involved a pyramid that Dan Abandon Ronald Shusett had. So it's weird that you see a pyramid in here. And of course, the guy who was the second, uh, second unit director and also the production designer manager was James Cameron himself. And you see little bits that he would use for aliens. Uh, like, kind of the landscape, or like, yeah, this team, this rescue team that goes in and goes in this wrecked up facility place and you know, that kind of reminds you of the marines going to 
you know, they're a rescue team going into his wrecked up place and aliens. And before I go on, just to mention, this DVD, if you're at all even kind of a fan of this, is real well worth it because you have a commentary with Alec Gillis is on there. You have uh, the actress Taffy O'Connell. You have a couple other folks on there on the commentary. It's a fun commentary. Sadly, no Robert Englund just said, hey, but oh well. But they're on, they are interviewed. There's pretty much the features all together is an hour long. You have interviews with Robert England and Sid Haig and uh, Taffy O'Connell, Grace Zabreski, who are the actors, uh, the director, Roger Corman, people who did the effects work, like Alan A. A. Pone, which actually they admit that that guy's name was used for aliens, you know, the character A. Pone, that Cameron named it after this effects guy, Alan A. A. Pone, uh, Douglas J. White, Alec Gillis. Um, the editors, they talk about you know the film coming out. Um, there's also a segment talking about James Cameron, how some people thought, wow, you know, he's very detailed. They think he's a genius. And some people kind of thought he was a dick. <laughs> um, a lot of good stories. I mean, it's an hour's worth of stuff. And the production design, I really enjoy. I mean, there are certain sequences I think are really good looking. Inside the pyramid, uh... I think the spaceship shots are fine. I, I mean, for a low-budget Roger Corman film from 1981, I think they don't look that bad. I've seen much, much worse. Throw a rock at a movie nowadays and it looks worse than Galaxy of Terror. Yes, I will say, I like this more than Prometheus. I have more fun with it, and in my opinion, this was less pretentious. And they had, you know, such a low budget, but I think they did a lot of work with that budget. They use it very well. Like you could tell people work their ass off with all the different creatures and monsters and and the sometimes HR Geeger your life, but actually sometimes their own pyramid like inside the pyramid structure. The only problem I have with this movie is the ending. Cause you have this really rocking thing where uh, the lead guy, like Robert England and the lead guy are the last survivors. And Robert England, like, he faces himself, and he realizes, okay, it's all in our fears. He faces his fears, and he survives. And then they find out that Ray Walson is the plant master. And you get an idea beforehand, because Ray Walson was talking to the female commander, saying, that's not real. Trying to, like, get her to face her fear, because maybe he thinks that she'd be material for the new master. Because basically, the gist of the plot is... Ray Walston is the Planet Master. He was the guy who had his fucking face covered in red. And he brought these people there because there needed to be a new master. Someone who would face their own fears. Because this pyramid and this place was like used as a like an ancient race's toy for kid, their ancient kids to face their fears. And so this is used for you know the one person who will face their fear. The one person who deserves to be the new because it's time to select a new plan master. And so, Robert England waits at the bottom of these stairs, and it's a nice scene where all these stairs like appear by themselves. Again, really great design and artwork for a low-budget film. And the guy's like, all these monsters you've seen throughout the film, the lead guy, Edward Albert, he's fighting, he's fucking up, his friends are zombies, he fucks them up, and he faces and destroys Ray Walston, but now he becomes a new plant master. And then the movie ends. I'm like, so that's my problem with the movies. The ending is like, okay, wait a minute. What does a plant master do? Because Ray Walson says, well, you could refuse, but then it'll put your planet into chaos. How do you figure? Like, what does a plant master do? Is Edward Allen now a bad guy? What happened to Robert England? Is he still alive? Is he dead? What's going on? So uh, the whole thing is like, I'm sort of confused with. What well, happened to Robert Englund's character? He's still alive. We last saw him at the bottom of the steps. Did they leave the planet? Uh, what's up, Edward Albert? Is he going to be a bad guy? Is he okay? He's new plan master, but like it wasn't really a satisfying ending. I got kind of confused by the ending. I'm like, really? Like he faces all this stuff, and this is the best way you could choose Ray Walston, the a new master. Like this is the best way. Like you can't do it through just. <laughs> regular ways of voting or something. So it's kind of a little bit confused and a little bit unsatisfying. 
I, I don't even know. Is it a downbeat ending in a way? But kind of. But I don't know. Just the ending is kind of confusing and uh, just not really a satisfying ending. But the rest of it I enjoy. I enjoy. I thought the actors were okay. I thought the art direction was good. The effects were fine. I like the idea of facing your fears with all these different creatures. And overall, I, I enjoyed Galaxy of Terror. I'm not a fan of the ending, but the rest of it I really enjoy. For what they did with low budget, they did a lot of stuff. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you.